Someone has said that you should live so that the preacher doesn't have to lie at your funeral. Amen. <laughs> and uh, Orange and I have known Clyde for five and a half years, and I actually knew his name and a little bit of him before that, uh, a couple centuries before that, I think. <laughs> anyway, um, one thing that Orange and I both agree on is that we never get tired of listening to Clyde tell his stories. And uh, we truly enjoy rejoice in that. And uh, I know he is a truthful guy and full of integrity. That's what I way I've, way I've experienced him. Well, let me just give you a summary of some of the uh, things about Clyde. Clyde was born on December 11th, 1933, in a little old brick hospital in Bridgeton. And his working life started in Millville at one of the bond stores, and he made an astounding 50 cents an hour. And his real first money making uh, <clears throat> money making job was in a junior uh, year in high school when he borrowed twenty six thousand dollars to buy three oyster grounds and a 45 foot oyster boat now, Clyde I'm not sure how you were able to get that uh, loan so so the way you did but that's amazing My dad knew the I helped a lot <laughs> your father had a lot of collateral didn't he yeah. okay he uh, set it up the bay for seed oysters in May and June with a hired captain, and uh, in a two-month season, the business was paid off, and some of the money was actually in the bank as well, which is amazing in itself. But after graduation, Clyde went to uh, went, went in business with his father, Captain Clyde A. Phillips. From there, after his marriage to his Asbury College sweetheart, Mary Giles, Mary Hales from uh, Deep Step, Georgia. He joined the regular army and was uh, stationed in the Bavarian Alps of Germany. I, he's talked about that to us. Marge and I have had probably at least 10 dinners with you. And uh, we've had a lot of stories. And the stories of the Alps is, really amazes me in many ways. A place that I would love to go. But he served three years on active duty as a medical technician, a laboratory technician, and three years in a reserve unit in Ohio. Another year on extended duty, inactive, during the Cuban miss Missile Crisis. Uh, he was then working for Stowman Shipyard, where he worked as a boat carpenter, a workboat carpenter, and a chief of the uh, scraping, was that scraping or scrubbing? Scraping. Scraping uh, and a scrubbing crew on newly hauled boats. And uh, he became the tugboat captain as well, delivery captain, a mill hand, a boat planker, then he moves into a new porter crew uh, that built 40-foot sailboats. I'm wondering what you didn't do, because you had so much you learned. But he soon was running the plywood shop where he made large sheets out of a, uh, small sheets. The biggest ran an astounding 10 feet wide by 100 feet long, which is amazing. He also built the mast, the booms, and the bow sprits, and, and much of the framing, and he soon became a rigger. And this job required the making of all the rope and cable rigging, attaching the rigging to the mast, and then stepping the mast, and, uh, and tuning the rigging and bending on the sails, and then taking the boat for a trial ride or a trial sail. For over 13 years, Clyde was the research vessel captain at Rutgers University Oyster Research Lab, where he was a marine biologist, basically studying the oysters in the bay. And he's got a lot of stories about that too. <coughs> Should ask him sometimes. His big scientific goal remains the photograph of a few Wilson's petrels, these little seabirds that you may be familiar with that remain offshore uh, of New Jersey during our summer, and they nest in the southern end of South America during our winter. Now there's no scientific records that the, these, this species has the ability to walk on water, but both Clyde and his father separately had witnessed that particular feat. So. Uh, I would be interested to see that as soon as you get those pictures. <laughs> His other life was entirely different, that he, uh, and he had become a people person. This is a life that probably is more familiar to me. He was called to the position of a pastor of many small South Jersey United Methodist churches. He started out in a three-point circuit, which had to be tiring, served three small country churches in the Jersey Pines. In a short order, he served a variety of different appointments, and his second being the uh, associate pastor of the second largest Methodist church in southern New Jersey. And uh, I, I'm not trying to remember which one that was, Clyde. Oh, this one was Pittman. Pittman, oh yes, okay, all right, very good. Oh, this was followed by a small town church, and then he became the lead pastor of a four-church charge, 
uh, with a student pastor as an assistant. Now, having had two churches on charge before, I know it's tiring, but that had to be exhausting to you. And so it went, uh, preaching the gospel. He led people to the Lord. He taught Bible studies and Sunday school classes, all helping people know the glory and the love of the Lord. And I, I thank the Lord for that, too. But during this time, his wife Mary started a mission to educate the uh, children of Haiti. And you know Haiti is the poorest country in the Western Hemisphere. He helped in this as the mission supplied about 5,000 school uniforms. They were needed by the nations of the Caribbean because they required their children to wear uniforms to school. No uniform, no education, basically the way it worked. So after five years or so, the call came from uh, Haiti to uh, provide supplies for the schools. And that mission grew to include all the Greater New Jersey Annual Conference, uh, which then covered the entire state of New Jersey, a little part of the northeast corner of Pennsylvania, and a sliver of the state of New Jersey or state of New York as well. But several tons of supplies were collected and shipped to Haiti by this mission, and it's only been recently that that mission has uh, changed in its uh, format. But Clyde has been a longtime member of the Port Norris Rotary for 37 years the Aircraft Owners and Pilots Association for 44 years, Experimental Aircraft Association for 33 years, and by the miracle of timing, he became the number one member of the then schooner Clyde A. Phillips Incorporated organization, and still spends a lot of time there. He says, in correcting their mistakes, though he's a strong supporter of their work, and rejoices in it. Uh, to celebrate their Scottish heritage, uh, of both Clyde and his longtime wife, Mary, um, 62 years, in fact, a long-time marriage. They both are life members of the Clan Anderson Society as well. Now, if you've ever talked to Clyde, you appreciate his, his sense of humor. And uh, Marge and I have been uh, very appreciative of that, especially after having a long day of uh, preaching in three different services Sunday morning. We'd go out to lunch or go out to eat somewhere, and uh, Clyde would just uh, regale us with his, his, uh, his tales and his humor. And uh, we thoroughly enjoy it. But as Clyde looks into his future, it finds him passing from the shores of the Morris River to the shores of glory, where he hopes David will allow him to play that golden harp after he takes leave of this earth on July 7th of 2039. <laughs> so he's got a few more years left to go. But this is just a, you might say, a wee bit of the life of this living legend and shows just a wee bit of his joys. You have to talk to him because he has infinite number of stories, and I, I'm absolutely positive they're all true. Is that right? <laughs> Thank you for allowing me to have the privilege of sharing about Clyde. The pastor told you the good things about Clyde, and uh, I grew up near Clyde. So I've got a couple stories to tell you too. At uh, which point clients deny them, but uh, we'll see how that goes. Um, my house, the Robbins house, and Clyde Phillips. So he was two houses uh, from me. Clyde and his brother Toddy were older than myself, and still are. Still are. <laughs> And I, I wasn't a particularly bright child growing up, and uh, after you hear these stories, I think you'll, you'll find out why. But one, one day I was walking by Clyde's house, and Johnny and Clyde are out front, and they said, Dick, that apple tree over there's got some nice apples, let's go have an apple. So I said, that sounds good, thanks. So I go over, I pick an apple, and I chew it, and my face goes numb. Absolutely numb. I can't talk. <laughs> so I, I got home. I, my mother said, you don't look well. I don't feel good. So it turned out to be a persimmon tree. <laughs> and of course, Johnny and Clyde, you know, thought they were clean, like they were eating apples and whatever. So my father came home, and he, he thought it was pretty funny, actually. He, <laughs> and, you know, so a couple of weeks later, I was, I was uh, in front of their house again, and we had a... a a rainstorm, a heavy rainstorm that night, mud puddles all over the place. So I'm walking by, and here's John and Clyde. He said, Dick, we had a hard rain last night, and he said, that's always some good water that came out of the sky. 
So they lean down over a mud puddle and look like they're drinking the water. So I thought, well, that's got to be pretty good. So I lean down, I drink, the, I drink the water, and I get home and I get sick. So my mother said, did you eat something different today? I said, no. Do you feel all right? No. Well, what do you think happened? Why? Well, I just drank some water out of a mud puddle. So my father, my father comes home, and mom tells him this story, and uh, she said, "Court, I think you should talk to Johnny Fly." And he said, "My mother said, Jane, it's not Johnny Fly. The boy drank mud puddle water." <laughs> And he sort of looked at her like, we, we've got some work to do with this one. <laughs> so, toward, toward the end of the summer, Johnny and Clyde figured they're, they're going to do some camping in their backyard. So they set up a tent out near the edge of the woods and into their property. And uh, my dad comes in and wakes me up one night and he said, come on, we're going to have some fun, you, uh, some fun with uh, Johnny and Clyde. So we sneak over to behind our tent. He said, you were here by the woods. So he goes up to the tent and he scratches on the side and he makes these wild animal noises. Well, in about 10 seconds, here comes Clyde out of the tent. Here comes Johnny out of the tent, flying into the house. So on the way back home, my dad was laughing. And he said, well, now you're reading with Johnny and Clyde. <laughs> so, I, I told these, these uh, stories to Clyde one time at, uh, we were at the Moritown Historical Society. He said, oh, I don't remember that. Well, of course he didn't. He's not the one who drank the mud puddle. <laughs> right? So any, anyhow, um, the Phillips family, were, they, they were really great people. And, then, and you know, this was all in fun, and my father took it and it was fun and whatever. And it was, it was just part of growing up here. It was, it was a lot of fun. But um, Clyde's, Clyde's parents and his whole family were just, we're really good people, but um, just don't drink the mud bottle water. So if Clyde and, and any of your family would like to come up and present you with your plaque, and Megan Wren is going to help me present that to you. So anybody would like to come up with Clyde for a picture, that'd be awesome. While they're coming up, I certainly haven't known Clyde as long as all of you have here, but one of the things I enjoy doing with the Living Legends is to go out and photograph them, and um, Clyde wanted to go to his favorite birding place where he watches for eagles. So just happened, we had an eagle that sighting that day, didn't we? So I, I made you a couple of prints. Oh, wow. Okay, so they turned out okay. <laughs> Very good. I gotta tell you about this. <laughs> you don't often see a, an eagle that close to the road. But he's right there. Well, there was an old guy. We got out there on, the, on this bridge on the Glade Road over to Heislerville, where the uh, bridge crosses Riggins Ditch. And Mary and I spend two or three hours almost every day there watching the eagles. When we started there, we had two different nests. One over here about three quarters of a mile away and one over here about a mile and a quarter. And we kept our eyes on them for uh, about 15 years now. And I've watched these eagles. This, this is uh, from, from the nest, the first nest that we were watching. But here's this little guy, had a bucket with him, going down. Now Mary and I have talked with him. He's a real naturalist. He goes up with a scoop net and scoops up bait and stuff like that, take home, feed his fish. But he's out there with a bucket of fish. About, well it's fish story, right? <laughs> <laughs> About this big. Real fish story. And he told me, he says, I feed the eagles. And he says, you keep an eye on them, because when I go out there, they'll come down. And they did. 
he would he would just walk and he'd reach into his bucket and he would just drop the fish on the road keep on walking and he would only walk about three four or five feet and there's legal right in the back of him reaching down and like this one pick up the fish and the way they go and he feed about there was about four eagles that came in on that little feed and i thank you you're welcome this is great so you can if you want yeah sure anything you want to do well clyde i think he mentioned in his um in the words that he was actually our very first member he came he lived right across the street from where we had our meetings in Morristown. And uh, you know, there were a lot of people who looked at the Clyde A. Phillips at the time and said we were kind of nuts for trying what we were trying. But he, he came in and, and supported us from day one. And he always had his you know, perspective on the right way to do things. <laughs> and uh, it was great to have him. We did oral histories and got all of his recollections of the, of the schooner back in the time when she wasn't a schooner. And he, um, he supported us going back to the original name because he understood that she never sailed as the Clyde A. Phillips. But, she never um, was a schooner. Right. <laughs> but he's been there for all these 30 years supporting the organization. So. Um, and ever since it's been rigged, I've been telling her that it's rigged wrong. <laughs> and, and she hadn't done anything to change it. <laughs> Thank, you. Thank you very but much. But we get to listen to his stories every Thursday, so yeah. he's a good guy.